In the previous tutorial, I showed you guys a pre-racket stringing checklist, and I showed you how to string the mains. Now, in this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to string the crosses, which arguably takes up about 75% of the time and effort when stringing any tennis racket that you guys will ever come across. The reason why it takes longer for the crosses is because you guys have to weave up and down on the mains that you guys previously did on the racket. Now, I want to emphasize too that you want to take your time to prevent any type of unnatural notching for the crosses when you're doing this part of the racket. Yes, although on my live stream, which I do on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time, I did string a racket in about 12 minutes and 5 seconds with good technique. I'm not expecting anybody on YouTube to beat that. But if you want to try, challenge accepted. I want to see it. It'd be pretty cool. So let's get to it. How to finish string the racket. Tutorial part two, the crosses. This knot actually has a name and it's called the Parnell knot. And it is, in my opinion, the best starting knot for the crosses, whether or not you're starting at the head, which I suggest everybody does, or the tails, which I suggest nobody does unless you absolutely have to. So this is actually called the Parnell knot, but I'm going to call it the starting knot. I personally think that naming anything after your first and or last name, like a knot or hell, even a YouTube channel, is just way too pretentious and cocky and egotistical. So after pulling it through a candidate for sharing a knot, it's gonna be pretty similar starting off to a double knot, where you're gonna go over and then under. But the difference here with a starting knot versus a double knot is you're actually gonna go over inside the previous knot. So showing that again, you're gonna go through the previous knot just like that. And then you're gonna go up and through its own loop. And then what's nice is after it pulls tension, it'll actually hold. And when it does pull tension, this sharp part, which will be cut off obviously because you don't want any excess, will actually be pointing inside of the inside of the frame. It's not gonna be pointing out for a sharp object where you could accidentally cut yourself or accidentally shred a t-shirt on a follow through or take back. So this is the starting knot. This is gonna be a harder one than a double knot because it's not commonly as used, but with a little bit of practice, you guys will be experts in no time. So after finishing this Parnell knot on the top of the racket, when you start the cross, you always want to pull and weave, but not tension, just pull and weave one cross ahead. It's going to make your life a lot easier. And it is a pretty big sign that if you see this technique, the stringer has been stringing for quite a bit and can string a racket very efficiently. So for example, again, I could pull tension right now, but I'm gonna pull and weave one ahead. Just like that, and pull. Tension right here. Clamp it towards the edge. And also, what I suggest you guys do too, especially if you're brand new, is when you are pulling the crosses through to make sure that it's moving just a little bit because for more shaped or even rougher polyester strings, if you just pull it all the way through without doing that little maneuver, it's going to start to notch not only the mains a little bit, but also the crosses. 
Again, this is much more apparent for rougher shaped polyesters and copolyesters, not so much for the round ones or even the multi-filaments. But as I said, I weave one ahead all the way through, clamp it, and you can start to see why this takes up about three quarters of both time and effort for any racket stringer. By the way, if you guys are enjoying the tutorial on how to string the crosses on a tennis racket, please hit like and consider hitting subscribe for more original tennis content. That includes string reviews, match play, strategies, and other tutorials such as the one you're watching today. Thank you. But the nice part is, after you guys get the hang of it and you're on autopilot, there's really nothing stopping you from listening to music, watching some YouTube, hell, maybe even having coffee or a beer or a nice glass of whiskey while you're doing this. I've talked with quite a few other stringers from my YouTube channel, both on my live stream, my comments of my videos, and also on my Discord, which is now live. I'll leave a link to that in the description below as well if you guys want to hang out with us and chat and talk and talk about tennis strings and tennis in general. But after you get the hang of it, it's almost therapeutic. Truth be told, I would actually much rather string part-time than teach part-time. Because when I'm stringing, obviously I'm stringing for my condo and this is my machine, this is just my spare bedroom. I don't have to be at a tennis court at any certain point in time. Usually the clients just drop it off, give me a date, when they need it by, give me their attention, what string they want, and what time they want to pick it up, and I just get it done whenever. So it's not uncommon for a high level tennis player that plays regularly to be stringing anywhere from five to maybe even 10 rackets during the outdoor season or during the tennis season. And that's how people make their money back from buying an expensive string machine. When I bought this machine, and I did talk about this in the machine buying tutorial guide, which I'll also leave in the description below if you guys are interested. I bought this base machine, which is a gamma progression tool, slightly used from a former student of mine because he went to college and wasn't playing college tennis, unfortunately. I bought it for about 350 or $400. And it's a damn good machine then. It's been two years, no problem so far. But the problem is, it was a crank and I wanted an electric tensioner. So what I did was I saved up some money and then I bought this Tennis Head 2086 Professional Head Tensioner to replace the crank because it's a lot more accurate. In my opinion, it's a lot faster as well. I paid off the 950 or $1,000 worth of investment in the machine in probably just one month of just stringing tennis rackets about two years ago. Was it one month? No, it might have been about two months because that would be a lot of stringing in a month. But luckily for me, I have a pretty big network in the Metro Milwaukee area. So when people break a string, I usually pop in their head when they try to think of someone to string a racket at a fair price. And truth be told, for a string service alone, not the price of the material included, just the service alone, I personally only charge $10 a racket. Most tennis shops out there from Illinois or even around the Metro Milwaukee area, I've heard of tennis shops charging just for the service 
anywhere from 15 to maybe even 25 or $30 per racket. Again, that's just a service. That isn't including the strings. And the strings, depending on what string you want and what brand name you want, and whether or not you want natural gut, the strings themselves can cost anywhere from $10 to maybe even $50, which is absolutely outrageous. That's why I always, always, always suggest people that are gonna be playing tennis regularly for the rest of their lives to at least consider learning how to string and buying a tennis string machine. Now keep in mind, I've been stringing since I was in eighth grade, so that would make me about 13 years old. The very first racket I ever strung took me about four hours. I remember my mom coming home after her second shift job, and it was like 10.30 at night, and I was just crying, saying I could never do this, I could never learn. <laughs> I'm hoping nobody here will ever have to go through that. But YouTube really didn't exist back then, at least definitely not to the extent it is now. Actually, back in 2000, I don't think YouTube did exist on the public domain for people to use. So I basically had to learn very quickly on my own and asking my other tennis pros that I took lessons from on a somewhat regular basis how to actually string a racket. And then I just kind of figured that stuff on my own. So luckily for you guys, not only do you have the wealth of the internet in video format in the form of YouTube, but I'm hoping this tutorial is gonna have a good amount of value for you guys and anybody that you know that might want to learn how to string a tennis racket with good techniques in mind. That one had some trouble going through. I got it. So thankfully, we are in the last part of the cross. stubborn so if you guys want me to do more tutorials on more advanced techniques please let me know in the comment section down below I'd be more than happy to sit through the comments and see what you guys need the most finally got through so that was the last cross to weave pulling the tension on the second to last one So, some of you guys are probably wondering what the hell kind of knot you're gonna do for this very last cross. It's gonna be a regular double knot. The exact same knot you guys did when you ended both mains, which was in the very first part of this tutorial. I'll also leave a link in the description below for you guys if you guys didn't watch the first one. Sometimes knots don't follow through all the way, and that's okay. You can always redo them. That's what happens when you try to rush and impress a YouTube audience. <coughs> Gotta have some level of professionalism. Much better. So, again, if you guys haven't already, hit like, considering subscribe for more original tennis content. And as always, 
happy hitting.